Today on Know the Truth, a message from Philip de Corsi. Paul's suffering, Paul's imprisonment, Paul's abandonment, those who hurt him, he just takes it and uses it as a platform to preach the gospel. So that's the challenge to you and me. We need to take our suffering and our pain and the difficult things in life and let them become pulpits and platforms to preach the gospel. Are you using your trouble to testify that he's enough? Welcome to Know the Truth. I'm Wayne Shepherd, And today, Philip closes out our study on 2 Timothy with a look at what matters most. He's been telling us that this New Testament letter could also be called the Apostle Paul's deathbed statement because Paul penned these words while in prison awaiting his execution. And it's a closing message that offers sobering truth and rousing encouragement. Remember, you can always revisit your favorite lessons in this edifying study by going to our website, ktt.org. Search for this series without apology. Now here's Philip. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's writing to Timothy. He's about to die. So if this is Paul's last letter, I'm guessing he's going to be focused on the things that really matter. And that's why I took a second look at the passage with this idea. Paul, what really matters? You're about to die. Your martyrdom's just a month or two away. And if this is your last kind of you know, letter, and these are the last words in your letter. I'm guessing you've got a priority list going on here somewhere. And I started to look at it and several things jumped out. And here are five things that should matter. Let's start with the first one, friendship. Friendship matters. Now, we read here of this intimacy, this deep and abiding relationship between Timothy and Paul. Look at verse 2 of chapter 1. To Timothy, a beloved son. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. You therefore, my son. Paul is at the end of his life. He dispatches a correspondence off to this young man he loves deeply, urging him to be faithful to that which Paul's been faithful to, namely the treasure of the gospel. But beyond that, Paul mentions other people who are dear and near to him. Paul had a network of friends and co-laborers. This chapter, there are 19 people specifically named, 16 men, two women, and the Lord Jesus, who is the friend of all friends. So what's the point? Paul's writing his last few words, and included in that correspondence is updates and directions to his friends. He sends some of them, he scolds some of them, he salutes some of them, and he summons some of them. They were all close to Paul, some closer. And Paul's dying and he treasures them because what matters most in life? Number one, friendships. Number two, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Because if you reread these verses, you're going to see that Paul is isolated and abandoned. And he has faced opposition for his gospel commitment. Notice that verse 10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. I don't believe that Demas forsook Christ. I don't believe he was an apostate. I believe that he took cold feet. I believe the thought of this present world, convenience and comfort, drove him back to Thessalonica, where there was a church. But he didn't want to stand with Paul, because that came at a cost. And his love for his own preservation caused him to betray his friend. And that's there. Alexander the coppersmith, according to verse 14, does Paul much harm and opposes him and has stood in my way and he warns Timothy about him, which again would point to the fact he's somewhere in Ephesus. And Paul says, I just give him over to God. Then you've got the fact, verse 16, that no one stands with Paul, right? He's by himself. He's alone deserted, posed by foes, let down by friends. Well, he's got Luke, only Luke. He's wanting Timothy to come soon. But there he stands as a lonely soldier committed to the gospel. But that's okay for Paul. He wished it was otherwise, but whatever they do is not going to determine what he does, and so he remains faithful. 
what does he say to Timothy? Second Timothy 1 verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. We read in chapter 4 verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Remember we said, that's not subject to faith. He's saying, I die committed to the same gospel I heard that brought me to faith. I'm focused there right up to the end. And that's challenging, folks. Everything is secondary to his commitment to the gospel. What matters most? I want to know that. I don't want to flitter away my life. Friendship matters most. Faithfulness matters most. Forgiveness matters most. Go to verse 16. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. Man. What's your reaction, Paul? May it not be charged against them. That's powerful. He forgave them. He wasn't dying on others that hurt him. And here's another great lesson. You know what? As you go through life, keep short accounts. The issue isn't what happens to you. The issue is how you handle what happens to you. Are you going to allow the culture to dictate your reaction, your emotions to dictate your reaction, or the example of Jesus Christ on the cross to dictate your reaction? A couple of things about this just quickly. As we look at this little section, verses 17 to 18, I want you to see the Lord's power. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Love that. He assisted me to persevere. I am sensing there's grace for me to die victoriously as a martyr. The word strengthen means to be poured into or to have power given. Like an intravenous drip to a dehydrated man, Christ is pouring in grace to Paul to inflate his spirit, put hope into his eyes, to allow him to die faithfully for the gospel. So you've got the Lord's power. Secondly, you've got the Lord's protection The Lord was with me, strengthened me. Look at verse 17, the end. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the land. Now, this is a verse that has troubled some commentators. They're not sure what to do with it because if you know your history, and Paul was a Roman citizen, Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. That's why Paul will be beheaded. And Roman citizens were never sent to the arena to be fed to the beasts. So when Paul says here, I was delivered from the mouth of the land, we go, well, If you're a Roman citizen, what lion are you talking about? Well, could it be a reference to Satan? Could be. You've got 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. You have an adversary, the devil, who goes about like a roaring lion, seeking him in made of our. So that might be a reference to the fact that the Lord Jesus delivered him from some of Satan's traps and opposition. Could well be. Other commentators argue it could be a reference to Roman political officials. Paul has, you know, escaped many a time uh, situations where he's been arrested and then released. Either way, we can't be sure. But what is sure is that God delivered him. Somehow his head was in a noose and he escaped. Somehow it looked like he was heading for shipwreck and he stayed afloat. Just a wonderful thing that when you and I are going about the Lord's business and doing the work of his kingdom, we can be sure that he's going to be with us. And he's not only going to be with us, he's for us. And he's against those who are against us. And so Paul says, hey, the Lord reprieved me, delivered me. Didn't David say that? In Psalm 23, verse 5, you spread a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's a beautiful picture. I don't believe that in verses 5 and 6, we go from the outdoors to the indoors. Many commentators say, Psalm 23, verses 1 to 4, sheep, shepherd, 5 and 6, guest, host. But I think it's sheep and shepherd the whole way through. The Hebrew word table can be translated table land, and I think that's the picture. It's spring, the mountains are melting, you can take the sheep up and get some nice grazing ground. So you've got to go through a deep valley which frightens the sheep. And so the shepherd protects the sheep with his rod and his staff, takes them through the dark valley with the shadows, with the laugh of the hyena and the hiss of the snake. They get up to the table land. And what the shepherd does, he goes in and prepares the table land. So he'll go in and check there are no predators. He will dig up weeds and poisonous plants with the end of his staff, leave those on a rock to just wither in the heat. 
He will then take some oil and put it around viper nests so that the snakes won't come out because they hate the thought of the oil on their skin. He also takes some of that oil and anoints the head of the sheep, rubs it in so it's a repellent against bugs. How good is the shepherd? And it's all a picture. So the shepherd prepares the table land for eating for the sheep in the presence of their natural enemies, the snakes, the hyenas, the wild dogs. And David said, that's what God has been to me. In the presence of my enemies, when I've been under fire, the shepherd has guarded me. Folks, you and I can believe that. Sometimes our deliverance from God is unknown to us. Sometimes we don't even know when he delivered us because we weren't aware of the threat. Just like sometimes a soldier is unaware of the fact that they are in the crosshairs of a sniper's rifle. Sometimes God has delivered us and we're not even aware of it. Secondly, sometimes he delivers us from the trouble. And so before it gets any worse, God just shuts it all down. And we avert a disaster. We don't have to go through that painful experience. Sometimes our deliverance is within the trial. We don't like this one, but that's the way it is. Sometimes God calms the storms, but I'll tell you, most of the time, he calms us in the storms because he never promised us that we wouldn't face storms, trouble. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And then finally, sometimes he delivers us straight to heaven. Oh, Lord, I'm tired, tired of all this nonsense, tired of all this fighting. The Lord goes, that's okay. Why don't you come home this afternoon? straight to heaven, and we're delivered right out of it all. But the one beautiful thing is that the Lord delivers us from every evil work. Sometimes we're not aware of it. Sometimes he delivers us completely out of it. Sometimes he delivers us from the fear and the anxiety that we would naturally have within it. And sometimes he just delivers us by taking us to that perfect place itself. The Lord's power, the Lord's protection, the Lord's providence Notice the in verse 17, so that the message might be fully preached through me to the Gentiles. Paul is not silenced, he's strengthened, and he's strengthened for further proclamation of the gospel. There's every reason to believe that either at his first hearing or his second hearing leading to his martyrdom, Nero would have been there, the emperor himself, mad Nero, who burned Rome down and blamed it on the Christians. Can you imagine that? What if that's true? Paul's actually preaching to the emperor. If not, he's certainly preaching to those in the Roman government. And he says, hey, you know what, Timothy? This has been rough. Nobody was with me in the first trial. You know what? All kinds of stuff's going on. This place stinks to high heaven. It's cold. It's damp. Bring me my coat. Bring me some books. But you know what? I got to tell you this. I got an opportunity to more fully preach the gospel. He did that in his first imprisonment, didn't he? where he says in Philippians 1, verses 12 to 18, these things have fallen out for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul's suffering, Paul's pain, Paul's imprisonment, Paul's abandonment, those who hurt him, he just takes it and uses it as a platform to preach the gospel. So that's the challenge to you and me. What matters most? The Lord matters most. And he will empower us and protect us to preach his gospel. And we need to take our suffering and our pain and the difficult things in life and let them become pulpits and platforms to preach the gospel, to show that Jesus is enough. Are you using your trouble to testify that he's enough? Just recently, I was reading something of the life of Corrie ten Boom. You know her story. Her and her father and her sister Betsy had hidden some Jews in their house in Holland. Nazis took them, sent them to a concentration camp, and eventually Betsy will die in a Nazi concentration camp. But before she dies, she shares on several occasions with her sister, you know what, Corrie, when we get out, here's what I want us to do. I want us to get a home, and I want to get some of these ladies who are with us here in the camp. If we all survive, and we're all going to live together and just rebuild each other's lives, would that be not cool? Here's what she says one day, I quote, We must get out of here and tell everybody that there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. They will listen to us, Corey, because we have been here. And you know why you listen to some people? One, because they're expert and they're very good, or they're a compelling speaker, or because they have gone through something you can identify with. You know why Corey Ten Boom made such an impact for Christ? Not only because she was godly and a gracious lady, She had been there. 
when she talked about suffering, you couldn't trump her suffering. And so when she speaks, there's no pit so deep. He's not deeper still. You got to sit up and start believing that stuff. And Paul used his pain as a platform. What matters most, friends? Faithfulness, faith, forgiveness, and forever. These were Paul's last days. But he carried within his heart the hope of heaven. And it made all the difference. Look at verse 18. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. See, I missed that the first time around. I'm reading all about Tychicus going here and and Carpus here and this person there. And yet there's this little kind of stem. Well, you know what? I'm on my way to heavenly kingdom. Well, that's got to be significant since you're about to die pretty soon. Yeah, you better believe it. Forever matters most. You got to have the hope of heaven. You're not ready to live until you're ready to die, and I'm ready to die because on the other side of my death is joy forevermore. In fact, this theme of forever is throughout this letter. In chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, you know what? Concerning Jesus, he abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Immortality, everlasting life, a never-ending existence of joy and pleasure. In chapter 2, verse 10 and 12, he talks about if we'll die with him, we'll live with him. If we'll endure, we'll reign with him. He talks about eternal glory in verse 10 of chapter 2. In chapter 4 and verse 8, he talks about the crown of righteousness that is laid up for him, and not only for him, but Christ will give it on that future day to all who love his appearing. Verse 1 of chapter 4 talks about the judge coming the Lord Jesus, and his kingdom coming. Paul's been looking forward to trading here for hereafter for a long time. And now it's come. And he's good with it. Because he didn't think about heaven at the last minute. He's been thinking about heaven every day of his life. It defined his life. It brought joy to his life. It gave him perseverance and hope in the midst of suffering. And now it's just over the horizon and he's okay with it. I've been preserved for the heavenly kingdom. And that's what matters most. I've got a new King James. It says in verse 8, finally, there is laid up for me. But if you've got an old King James or you've got an ESV, I'd rather have that translation. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. That's all future. That's somebody that's got something to live for, henceforth. Do you have a henceforth part of your life's philosophy? Or does it all end at death? Have you got the hope of heaven through faith in Jesus Christ? Paul did. And the henceforth of a new body, the henceforth of a nature that didn't sin, the henceforth of a full knowledge of life, a henceforth of a new heaven and earth, and a henceforth of Jesus' glorious presence, that was enough for him. As he put his head on the chopping block, literally, he indeed was possessed by a sense of boundless joy and breathtaking glory on the other side of it. And it would make up for all the losses and all the crosses. Hey, Paul, you stood alone. You've carried many a cross for the sake of the gospel so the Gentiles might fully hear. And he's going to go, but do you realize Two minutes in heaven will wipe that all out. So he lives with the henceforth. Let me finish with this story that I stole from Billy Graham in a book called Nearing Home. It's the book he actually wrote not long before he died. Just talking about nearing home. He talked about, hey, here's my thoughts about heaven, why I believe I'm going to be there. Well, in the book, he tells the story about a police officer who pulls over a distinguished-looking lady who was speeding, And as she rolls the window down and the officer asks her to explain why she was speeding, the the older gentleman, her husband, sitting in the passenger seat, he kind of laughed and he said, Officer, let me tell you this. We were speeding to get to the place before we forget where we were going. (laughs) Now, when you get older, you'll understand what they're talking about. We were speeding to get to the place before we forgot where we were going. Billy Graham talks about that and he says, you never want to forget where you're going and let it define everything about your life The henceforth should be in the here and now. You know what? Paul never forgot where he was going and it kept him going when he was alone, a cold night, not in Marmotime prison, all the crosses and losses. 
He had engaged for the gospel. It's all worth it. The minute in heaven will obliterate all that stuff. I know where I'm going. That's going to keep me going. That's what matters most. Friends, faith, faithfulness, forgiveness, and forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time in the Word. And what a rich passage of Scripture. Sometimes we come to these lists of names in the travel log of gospel preachers across the Roman Empire, and we can miss something of what's going on. And, and, and we've been enriched as old Paul, nearing the end of his life, takes up his pen for the last time, and he tells us what matters. Oh, Lord, help us to favor friends. Help us to have real ones. Help us to work hard at making them lifelong. Oh, God, these are days of apostasy, cultural antagonism. The world is against us and the gospel. But may we have the spirit of an Athanasius. We're against the world. We, we love Jesus more than life. We're going to stand for his gospel regardless. Lord, we thank you that we don't stand alone. Thank you for the precious knowledge that our Savior supplies what we need, protects us from evil, and wants us to use our trouble as a means of testifying to his grace. Lord, it's, it's hard to forgive sometimes. But if we're honest, we know when we lie on that deathbed, we'll have wished we had forgiven more. We'll be repenting ourselves of bitterness, hard-heartedness. So, so help us to just empty some of the stones out of that bag we're carrying. Make the journey a little bit lighter. Above all, help us to think about what lies henceforth. Help us to keep eternity in mind within time. Thank you for this passage that will help us indeed to concentrate our minds wonderfully on the things that really count for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. This is Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and the conclusion of a message titled, What Matters Most? The last message in our study of 2 Timothy titled, Without Apology. If you'd like to revisit this series or share it with friends and family, you'll find it online at ktt.org. And we're glad to have you with us today. As a faithful listener of Know the Truth, we want to say thank you for your support. It's your listening, sharing, and giving that keeps this Bible teaching program on the air, bringing the truth of God's Word to people across the country and abroad. And right now, I want to take a moment to invite you to partner with us by giving a one-time gift of any amount. Your support of $25, $50, $100 or more will help the gospel reach more listeners so they can become more firmly rooted in the Word of God. Call us at 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And when you give, you'll receive God vs. Government by Nathan Busnitz and James Coates. This riveting book uses real-life examples and offers guidance and wisdom on how to respond when the state encroaches upon the church, providing biblical answers about remaining discerning and faithful to our Heavenly Father's commands, even when society tells us to do otherwise. You'll definitely want to read it for yourself and share it with others. Just call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And if you'd prefer to write, address your envelope to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. And if you've never reached out before, we have a special gift for you, a refreshing devotional titled Resting in God's Daily Sufficiency. It's yours just for contacting us. Learn more at ktt.org. One last thing, to stay up to date on upcoming events, ministry announcements, fellowship opportunities, and more, look for us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Just search for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Well, I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Join us again tomorrow for a special interview with Philip. That's Friday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.